the physics happening near the black hole. So this is a look from the um, Chandra X-ray Visionary Program. Um, so very, very deep observations, a megasecond of observations with Chandra um, to, to look down and see what the X-ray emission looks like um, very close to Sagi star. So this blue circle you're seeing here is the Bondi captor radius roughly for our black hole. Um, the green contours are showing you the flare emission from Sagi star in contrast to the quiescent emission, which is shown here in the kind of color scale in the background. This is a nice zoom in. This is work from Daniel Wang um, and the XVP collaboration a few years ago. You can really see how symmetric the flare emission is and how elongated the quiescent emission is. So to zoom out a little bit and put this in context, we actually think that all of this hot X-ray emission is coming from kind of a haze. So here's this beautiful multi-wavelength image of Sag A star. Um, here are the S star clusters. We've heard about these a little bit over the last few days. Um, so this is really the thing we call the cluster. This is one of the rotating disks. And the artist that helped Jeff and I make this for um, uh, sky and telescope, it kind of has done the X-ray emission as this sort of haze of emission here. So it's important just to note um, that the S stars, when you think about them, they're actually punching through this hot plasma, this accretion flow um, that we're tracing out in the X-ray. And this is a really nice simulation from Monica, um, sort of giving us a visualization of what we think might be happening way down at the very smallest scales in the middle here. So you, I think you saw this plot from Frank uh, Eisenhower during his talk yesterday, but this is sort of trying to trace out now what the, um, what the, um, density versus radial distribution of material looks like. Um, that's also, so it's traced out here in terms of number density, here in terms of accretion rate versus radius for um, Sagittarius A star. And the various probes that we have kind of marching out from, you know, the Bondi radius are larger, those stellar winds that fuel the accretion onto Sag A star. And then can we really understand the temperature density and the radius density profile of the material as we march in toward the event horizon? And you can see those Chandra profiles that I was just showing you are helping us understand what's happening out at relatively large radii. Um, drag forces on objects like that G2 um, object that Frank also mentioned can help us understand what's happening um, to that inner accretion flow. And then we get into these kind of more horizon scale metrics, the rotation measure, polarization, and then the size and SED. So all of these are um, individual different multi-wavelength probes that allow us to really try to understand what that temperature density and uh, accretion density structure looks like near the black hole. So I mentioned the flares. The flares are another very interesting phenomena that we've seen for Sag A star. This is a little movie. The persistent source here, the persistent source from the Chandra X-ray Observatory is a nearby magnetar that went off in 2013. And then we've got two very bright flares. You're seeing the brightest one in this little movie, but you can also see that bright flare here from 2013. Um, this is what a quiescent image looks like. So we've clipped out the flare interval so you can see kind of what Sag A star looks like when it's not flaring um, at the same time um, of Chandra observations. And then a few years later or about a year later we saw another very bright flare. So these two bright flares are interesting. Um, they're, here they are kind of superposed on the distribution of flares. This is a plot of fluence versus duration for all of the flares that were detected during that very deep XVP program. And here are their light curves. This is that very, very bright flare which we nicknamed F1, and here's that slightly less luminous, but still very bright flare, um, F2. And so we've done a quite a bit of looking at um, bright flares like this one. I could talk to you about the spectrum and other things, but I'm gonna skip over that due to time today and just dive into thinking about the multi-wavelength part of this. So we did a simultaneous VLA observation. So this is that same very bright flare. You can see that kind of classic two-peak structure um, and tried to understand whether or not we could um, correlate the X-ray and radio um, luminosities here, the, the variability. Um, and so I did this work with a, a postdoc in my group from a few years ago, Dan Capalupo. Um, if you assume here, just taking for a second that the radio actually peaks here, which we don't have um, certainty about because this is you know the gray bar here is showing you when our observations are less and less good as Sag A star goes down toward the horizon. Um, so we're not really confident we've cut, captured the peak of this flare. Um, so Dan and I did do some analysis, Dan in particular, cross-correlation. The lag between these two peaks, if it's indeed real, is something like 125 minutes. Um, a cautionary note, though, I have a plot that I could share at the end of the talk if people are curious, but we actually cross-correlated this um, bright flare with a whole bunch of epochs that were not simultaneous and found very strong correlation peaks. And I think the, the moral of that story is that that Sag A star is so variable at radio wavelengths that you can take any X-ray flare and cross-correlate it against almost any radio light curve and find some cross-correlation peak, not necessarily indicative of a connected physical origin for the two. 
So another campaign that um, has been really exciting recently is a simultaneous Chandra Spitzer campaign. Um, so the work here, the early work has been done by Joseph Ora, who I should be citing here as well, Gunter Witzel and my graduate student Hope Boyce. So one of the things that the challenges we face with light curves like this one is that we don't actually have very long um, overlap between the two wavelengths. So the X-ray light curve is very long in this case, but the radial light curve is only six or seven hours usually. So we got this beautiful joint um, campaign where we have really exquisite 24 hour fully simultaneous light curves. So these span about 24 hours for the X-ray and um, the infrared. Um, and we had a few opportunities to catch X-ray and infrared flares where we can now really definitively associate them because we can see the light curve before and after. Um, so this is the work, uh, the data that was collected in uh, a sort of exploratory program in 2014, and then some, the really, really um, sort of in-depth programs in 2016 and 2017. We also have some beautiful new data um, for a similar program in 2019. Um, and I also want to highlight some very, very um, new work that's coming out by Gunter Witzel. It's already up on the archive, but showing you what the SMA and ALMA light curves look like here compared to the same Spitzer light curves in 2014, 2017, um, sorry, 2017. 2014, 2016, and 2017. Um, so these multi-wavelength campaigns are very, very challenging to coordinate, but they're starting to really pay dividends as we start to pull these um, different uh, data sets together and try to understand them as a whole, as a piece. Um, so this is Hope's earlier work, um, cross-correlating just the Spitzer and Chandra. Um, and so these are the cross-correlation um, uh, figures down at the bottom for cases where we had an X-ray flare. And you can see this red line here would be consistent with simultaneity between the infrared and the X-ray. Um, so you can see that there is a little bit of a lag um, with the, the infrared data um, slightly lagging behind the X-ray data, but it's not a super strong correlation. So hope- Sorry to interrupt, there are uh, two minutes. Great, okay. So let me, I'm just gonna zip through then. So this is the cross correlation uh, analysis of these. So this is the X-ray leading the infrared. This is the infrared leading the X-ray. You can see most of our data seems to lie here um, in the domain where the X-ray seems to come before the infrared, but note the very large error bars. So this is still an ongoing process to try to understand what's happening here. Um, and I'll, I'll leave these conclusions up in my, um, in my final slides. I wanna say also Gunter Witzel, I'll just sort of throw this up here. It's a really fantastic, cool work. He's trying to actually model kind of phenomenologically based on these data sets, um, what's going on and how these different variability um, uh, pieces might be able to fit together across all the wavelengths and looking at how that's changing in the SED. So I'll point you to Gunter's really nice work that's out on the archive. Um, a few other things to highlight for SAGE star there's also really amazing GRMHD simulations coming out of Sarah Markarth's group. Um, Kushik Chatterjee and Dusun Yu um, are doing really fantastic, beautiful GR simulations um, to try to understand, again, this multi-wavelength and variability phenomenology together. Um, and these are some of the synthetic light curves that they've made for the, from these GRMHD models. We're working really hard to now compare these to the data and extract science out of that. Okay, so moving on to M87, um, just very quickly, you've saw it, seen a lot of this in Shep's talk on the very first day. So M87 has, you know, stolen all of our hearts with this incredible image. Um, and the EHT multi-wavelength working group is really excited that we're just about to be able to share our first um, big results on the M87 campaign. So this is a kind of a snapshot of all the campaigns working together. Um, really huge shout out to all the collaborators on this. This is a preliminary SED, a fully simultaneous, um, within a few days at least for all of these observatories, looking at M87 all at the same time. So this is the place where I'm gonna toss the football to Sarah so she can pick up and talk about um, how we've interpreted these results tomorrow. So please, please tune into that talk. Um, but let me just say here that this has been an incredible collaboration, people from everywhere all over the world, a huge collaboration of collaborations to collect these data for M87. And we're really excited to be getting ready to share these results. I just want to make a plug since we're thinking ahead about NGHT. Um, I work very closely with the X-ray groups and here's some of the amazing joint Chandra New Star work that was done um, primarily out of Joey Nielsen's group at Villanova. Um, and just to say, you know, Chandra is not going to be with us forever. So if we want to be able to do this for our next generation of targets, we've got to get busy and start collecting this data for them now. Um, so that's a sort of a segue into my next slide, which is just to point out again this wonderful ether sampler that you heard about from Neil Nagar and uh, Venki uh, yesterday. And just to say, you know, we really, really have amazing other targets we can look at, and we need to begin our multi-wavelength and long-term monitoring today in order to be ready for NGEHT when it comes along.
Um, so this is just to say that we're continuing to do EHT coordination um, and you're all um, invited to, to talk with us, myself, Sarah Kazuhiro, we're all very excited about this work um, and about con seeing it forward um, into the next few years. So um, I'll just put up my slides here, uh, my conclusions, just to say tons of exciting work, so much data and so much modeling happening and I'll stop there. Cool, thanks very much, Daryl. Um, we have time for one quick question. If anyone has one, please raise your hand. Uh, Nick. Oh, we are clapping, sorry. <laughs> uh, anybody has a quick question? If not, um, we can jump right into our next talk. Uh, next up is Roman Gold, and he's gonna be talking about GRMHD simulations of supermassive black hole binaries. So please go ahead, Roman. Thank you very much. Um, nice talk, Dara. Always a tough act to follow. Uh, I try my best. <laughs> yes, uh, supermassive black hole binaries. Uh, I like to talk about uh, these GRM MHD simulations uh, in full general relativity that I've started working on in 2012, then had a little bit of a break. Uh, and last week on the archive uh, was a recent uh, work by my collaborators, Pascalides, Bright, and Ruiz. Um, you, can, uh, you can find the archive link there or click on the link. But I also talk about uh, how to connect these things possibly in the future with uh, VLBI observations. And that involves a number of other collaborators uh, that I've listed below. I also would like to uh, mention that at the University of Southern Denmark, where I'm currently at, there's a nice space initiative starting. Uh, and uh, it involves a couple of partner institutions in Denmark uh, involving natural sciences, tech faculties, and so on, Danish Space Agency. So hopefully uh, there's a nice partnership uh, emerging that could be useful, for example, for some space BLBI additions. Uh, but here we go. So the simplest thing that you can think about when you try to detect a binary is, of course, to have an extremely simple model that just involves, uh, let's say, two Gaussian blobs that are moving on Keplerian orbits. And once you have that implemented, um, you can then uh, compute the kind of data that the radio VLBI instrument will measure, such as the visibility amplitude, closure phases, or complex visibilities. And you can do that very, very quickly. And that's implemented now in uh, the major uh, parameter inference model fitting framework that we've been using in the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration called TEMIS. Uh, and it's you know, capable uh, to do these Bayesian inference type things uh, for all kinds of different models and can combine different models of different types knows how to do that, all this interfacing business is uh, nicely solved. And so that allows uh, for an interesting uh, approach that, uh, that is called hybrid modeling. Uh, so far, we've been doing this with uh, image domain and let's say ring models for obvious reasons. But in principle, you could also think about a similar modeling approach where you incorporate information from the binary motion on the level of visibilities and you combine it with an imaging component that takes care of the uh, more diffuse or jet-like emission or something uh, to hunt down for these sources. Uh, so that's all very exciting. Um, and it's all uh, implemented at a very simple level, but clearly things can be more complicated. Before I dive into the uh, additional complications, um, let me just motivate really briefly why, why all this is so cool. Um, so we've heard about the pulsar timing arrays and, and uh, LISA like uh, science and the populations that they can see. And, um, and we've also heard in these talks that there's a significant source of population overlap uh, between these instruments and what uh, radio VLBI measurements uh, can potentially deliver. Um, so, uh, so the idea would be that we have some gravitational wave detection of some source, uh, hopefully uh, from the same source, some kind of VLBI detection where we can visually see the, the binary um, moving on, let's say, timescales of months, perhaps, or something like that. Uh, and then if you combine those two together, then you can obviously do extremely interesting things, especially when you start to detect these sources at different redshifts, uh, and you get a luminosity distance measurement from the gravitational waves, you get an angular diameter distance measurement from VLBI, uh, and then you can play these like standard ruler games. Uh, so this is extremely exciting stuff. Now. Um, Clearly, uh, things are more complicated than uh, orbiting two Gaussians. Uh, so you want to have a hierarchy uh, in your modeling approach that involves these extremely simple things that are extremely fast and computationally very, very efficient um, to more intermediate models where you can think of semi-analytic type uh, Ryoff models where the disk model uh, has a sort of realistic morphology, but it ignores other things like turbulence uh, and other complexities. It's an intermediate step. Uh, it's not quite as simple and fast as the previous one, but it allows uh, for, for more complex um, uh, inferences and then it's a, it's a more physical model. And then you can go all the way to the GRMHD simulation side, which is of course the most challenging one. But as I will show you now in the next couple of slides, um, 
where, where we've also made some great inroads. So let's look at this um, uh, paper from uh, from last week. Um, this is uh, this is an image uh, 3D rendering of a full GR uh, accreting supermassive black hole binary simulation. So this is solving Einstein's field equations in the dynamical spacetime regime, and it involves an accreting turbulent magnetized disk. And this is state of the art, and it has been state of the art for quite some time. Um, you can see that the black holes, and this is a crucial point I'll be making, are resolved objects on the computational grid. You see this in the inset. And it's a critical thing that Newtonian studies, or even perturbative GR studies, who are not throwing the black holes really on the computational grid, are missing. Uh, this is the kind of physics you want to resolve. You want to resolve how the magnetic field lines, which are here shown in white, are uh, anchored on the black hole horizons. And it's, uh, and it's this physics that basically gives gives rise to these interesting jet morphologies that are happening here. So that's one pure GR effect that you will simply miss if you treat this problem in a, in a Newtonian fashion. So what are the major findings of the paper? Um, so we have focused on mini disks that can form around each of those black holes before the merger. Um, and we had some hypothesis based on earlier studies from 2014 with the same code setup that indicated um, that uh, these mini disks can form when the Hill sphere um, is significantly larger than the ISCO around each of the black holes. And that kind of makes sense because if the Hill sphere um, shrinks as the binary spirals inward, at some point there's just no room to support stable circular orbits. So that was the idea. And we put it to the test. We launched a couple of runs where the spin orientations um, are, are different, uh, leading to different um, hierarchies between Hill sphere sizes and ISCO sizes. And we tested this hypothesis. And uh, what we found in our simulations was that there is a nice agreement with this hypothesis, which I will show you in the next couple of slides. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that these mini disks will start to disappear. Um, and that has to do with the fact that the ISCO depends on the spin, but it's, it, it does not depend on the binary separation. Um, and, the, um, and the Hill sphere uh, is linearly dependent on the binary separation, but it's independent of spin. So what, what is going to happen in this in-spiral situation is there will come a point where the mini disks have no room uh, to, uh, to exist. They will evaporate or drain, and that will hopefully produce a very interesting electromagnetic signature that you can uh, uh, wish to hunt down, and it depends on black hole spin. So that's a second purely uh, relativistic effect. And we're currently working, uh, well, I'm working with a different set of collaborators on a more computationally efficient setup that's more tailored to the kinds of systems we hope to see. So here you can see um, uh, some, some interesting plots. Um, so you see the black holes in this 2D slices, you see the disk around it and the white circles are showing the ISCO around each black hole. Uh, they have different spins, hence the different ISCO uh, extensions. And you can see the black dashed lines who are uh, indicating the Hill sphere, which is of course a Newtonian estimate. And here you can see that um, as, as long as there is sufficient room between the white circle and the black circle, um, like you can see on the, on the right, we are forming, we're seeing mini disks forming. And uh, when these circles become more comparable in size, then no persistent mini disks are observed and the flow is more radial in perfect agreement with our hypothesis. Here you have a different case where we have asymmetric spins and even in these isometric, more complicated situations, uh, you can see the same picture holding up. When there, when, whenever there's a lot of space between the uh, ISCO radius and the Hill sphere radius, we observe mini disks around these black holes. And whenever they are starting to get more comparable, like here or here, we're seeing a more radial flow that doesn't show these disks. So um, here's finally a movie, I hope I still have time, where you can see uh, an accreting black hole binary merge in real time. Uh, so the white magnetic field lines are anchored on the black hole horizons. It's actually an older simulation from 2014, but it's still in terms of GR aspects, state of the art. You can see that these black holes are getting closer and closer together. They're emitting gravitational waves, of course, as they're doing that. They merge uh, and the simulation uh, just runs through this. And by now the black hole will have settled down to a curse solution. And uh, interesting uh, spin changes occur and all these things. That can all be done. Okay, time to conclude. Uh, so I think it's really time that we're starting to resolve not only shadows, but uh, black hole pairs with EHT or NGEHT. Uh, the modeling uh, is already implemented on various stages of complexity, and I think that will be key. 
And I will also highlight that the model interfaces that are so important to get this done between the GRMHD code and the code that can do the ray tracing and the radiative transfer uh, problem is already fixed. Uh, that same radiative transfer code is already coupled to our Bayesian inference scheme. So all the interfaces are in place. Uh, and now we are in an excellent si um, situation where we can bring these GRMHD models uh, in direct connection with VLBI data. And uh, it will be important to combine image information, visibility information, super resolution, and that sort of thing. Uh, hopefully involve polarization information, and of course the multi-wavelength aspects, which will obviously be quite exciting for these systems. Uh, right, thanks. Uh, that's all I had. Thank you. Cool, thanks very much, Robin. Um, do we have any questions? Please raise your hand. Uh, I actually have one. You were talking about um, how you have those mini disks forming before the merger around both uh, black holes and then they kind of evaporate. What happens to the jet? Oh, excellent point? question. Yeah, jets are pretty much a, a feeding dependent uh, phenomenon. So we're definitely seeing some dynamics associated with how the mass is being sloshed around in the, in the mini disks. The mini disks are kind of the buffer. So it seems that the mini disks determine the jets uh, more than the circumbinary disk, of course, uh, unsurprisingly. Uh, so, um, but we haven't looked at that particularly closely in that paper. So that's a very good comment. Uh, should be a follow-up uh, work, absolutely. Cool. Um, Daryl. I just was wondering, um, um, I have an echo, but hopefully you can hear me okay. The, I'm wondering whether or not you can constrain spins, either of the two sources as they come in or the, in the resulting black hole and how well and what are the parameters or, I and mean, what are the sort of observables or how do you get a handle on that? You mean on the uh, mini disk evaporation side or the radio VLBI? Because you could do both, I guess, but. <laughs> yeah, tell me about the mini disks just because I'm less familiar with that. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, the, the, the mini disks, that, that's kind of the hope. There's of course the different, uh, the difficulty that, um, the source size or some, some kind of emission surface will depend on wavelength and all that stuff. So there's some uh, nasty calibration, I guess, that one has to do. But assuming that can be done, uh, in, in principle, the, the binary separation at which the mini disks will evaporate and cause, I guess, a loss of the hard part of the spectrum uh, will depend on the black hole spin. So um, especially if you have a gravitational wave detection, you will have a handle on the binary separation. And, um, and then I guess within some limits, one could say something about the, the spin. Yeah, absolutely. Cool, thanks. Uh, we have time for one more question, uh, Shahar. Hi, I, I was just wondering, uh, in, in the process of bringing the binary to, to a merger, I mean, there, uh, obviously there's a role for the gravitational waves emitted, but is there also a role for the accretion disk? Does it also slow down uh, or kind of uh, make the binary collapse? If you, if you could turn off the gravitational wave, could they also, could it still, um, collapse to a single black hole just from the kind of friction with the, with the disk? Uh, so in this regime where we talk about supermassive black hole binaries, the gravity is entirely dominated by the black holes. So, um, so the, the, the black holes uh, themselves um, are pretty much like a vacuum numerical relativity simulation. So they're coming together and actually they, they outpace uh, the accretion disk at some point. So the in spiral gets so fast uh, that, the, that the disk is not able to follow. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Um, so unfortunately, we're out of time right now, but please um, continue asking your questions on the Slack or in the chat. So next up, we have Paul Tide, who's going to be talking about mapping space-time around Sag star using flares. So please go ahead, Paul. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. OK, perfect. Thank you. All right, yeah, so today I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about mapping Sagittarius A star with flares. And so the major uh, reason why I'm focusing on this is, is Daryl uh, very, very well like uh, demonstrated is that Sagittarius A star is extremely variable and it, it actually flares around one to like three times a day, roughly, uh, depending on which, uh, which wavelength you look at. And, and this manifests in a few ways. There's, as, as Daryl described, there's a, a very, very good, uh, relationship between the X-ray and the infrared flare. So when there is an X-ray flare, there tends to be an infrared flare. But the, the connection between submillimeter is, is not so well understood. But one of the, one of the explanations for, the for, for what's causing these flares are from hotspots in, in the accretion disk. 
And so what this happens is, and this is like a really recent simulation from Bart, and I think he just gave it in a parallel session, is that in, in, these, in these highly magnetite accretion disks, you can have these magnetic reconnection events. And then these can end up dumping a bunch of very, very uh, high energy non-thermal radiation into the disk. And then what happens is, is that these uh, hotspots tend to orbit around the black hole. And, this was, and the effect of this was first predicted uh, by a paper by Broderick and Loeb in 2006. And one of, the, uh, one of the predictions from this was that during a flare, you would expect to see Sagittarius A star, or the center of light of Sagittarius A star kind of orbit. And this was exactly what was seen uh, in the 2018 gravity results, where during a flare, they, they saw the uh, center of light display the somewhat orbital motion. And this was actually well explained with a hotspot very close to the black hole, so at around seven, seven times the gravitational radius. And so one of, the, one of the questions we wanted to answer with specific focus to the EHT was, if you know there's this hot plasma orbiting around the black hole, can the EHT, can the current EHT array at 230 gigahertz actually measure this and extract it? So one of the first things we did was we updated that classic Broderick and Loeb 2006 flare model, where you have this uh, coherent Gaussian blob orbiting around the black hole. And what we did was we introduced the effects of shearing. And this is important because you would expect that this um, hotspot is embedded in some differentially rotating accretion disk. And these, uh, these flares can actually shear out very, very quickly. But once we had that model, we wanted to really assess um, what would happen what would happen to the actual hots, what would if we could extract it with the EHT. And so to do this, we created some synthetic uh, data using the 2017 EHT array. And then we applied our, uh, our Bayesian modeling technique that we've developed here with collaborators such as Roman and uh, Avery Broderick. And, and the nice thing about this in taking this Bayesian viewpoint is, is that we got to include a whole bunch of different types of model parameters. So we got to include the black hole spin, and then the spot properties like the density, size, injection time, and then also the accretion flow properties. And, and running through this with a, a standard MCMC scheme, we found that we were able to extract all the um, black hole parameters or all the, uh, all the hotspot parameters, including these initial location and accretion flow parameters. But what was really exciting for us was the parameters of, of particular interest, something like the accretion flow parameters is something that controls the inflow rate and something that controls the subcaplarian factor and the spin, we're all very precisely measured. And we are able to get sub percent measurements of these quantities. And this was, a, this was quite exciting to us. But we kind of cheated a little bit in, in what we did there. Uh, that, that synthetic data set in that test was just using a, a single spot orbiting around a black hole with no other material. And so to make sure that this was at least somewhat robust to the actual astrophysical effects we would see for Sagittarius A star, we considered a, a couple of very well-known systematics. One was we included a, a stationary or background accretion flow. Um, we know Sag A star has an accretion flow around it. And so it's really important to include these, these types of effects because it, the optical depth from the accretion flow can be very, very important. And it can really uh, start to squelch some of the signal or uh, the signature of these hotspots. The other thing is we did is we included a, a galactic scattering. There's actually two components of this. Uh, scattering uh, from the interstellar medium effectively blurs this hotspot motion. Um, but there's also this like refractive substructure piece, but we ignored that in the paper, although this, this can be added. But the important thing is that when you actually see when you combine the effects, this beautiful arcing structure that you see on this left-hand side becomes very, very suppressed. And so we were expecting the the reconstruction to get worse. But kind of to our surprise, it didn't get that much worse. And so what we found was that doing the exact same type of experiment with the exact same observation parameters, we found that the, uh, the reconstruction went from red to green when you include both the, the blurring and the, and the RIAF, or in the accretion flow background. And this factor of two is really nothing. You're still sub percent spin measurement. And so this suggests that at least the EHT 2017 array in this like admittedly very uh, idealized scenario can already make a very precise spin measurement. And so one of so one of the questions might be, why can it actually do this? And I think uh, a future, the, a next talk by uh, Shehar is going to go into this a little bit. But there is, there is a very strong theoretical explanation for this from a recent paper, for instance, from George Wong in 2020. And what this is, is that we're really, 
we're really doing a strong lensing experiment here. And we're measuring time, not only like the position of like n equal one and n equal two rings, which you've heard quite a bit about, but also time delays from these. And so for instance, if you track this out a little bit, you can see you have a hotspot forming. And then as it starts to travel around the black hole, it gets sheared out. However, at the same time that this is happening, you're actually getting the primary, that, uh, that secondary emission from this initial formation forming here. And so there's this time delay here, just from the time it takes for the light to travel around the black hole. If you go a step further and you let, wait until the spot's starting to come back around the front of the black hole, you see this primary emission, then you have this delayed secondary emission, and then you have this very thin but faint uh, delayed tertiary emission here. So we are, we are getting full sensitivity to these photon rings that have been described quite a bit so far in this talk. So this is, would be like the n equals zero photon ring or the n equals zero just direct emission. This would be the n equals one and this would be the n equals three, but we're also getting a little bit more because we're getting the, the time delay around it. And this is important when you compare it to something like the time averaged image where you don't, you don't get this type of information. You're throwing it away when you're just looking at this uh, static piece. And so specifically what's kind of what we're, we're looking forward to doing specifically with the NGEHT is, is capturing multiple hotspots because these hotspots uh, or these flares occur so, af so often, you can imagine that over some campaign, you could uh, be observing Sagittarius A star and catch multiple flares. And each time you capture one of these flares, you can do one of these, uh, these measurements of the flare that include something like the spin and the mass, and as well as the characteristic radius of that hotspot to so something like where it was formed. And using that, you can get independent measurements of space time at each radial slice. And so using this, you can kind of construct a, a, a test of general relativity where general relativity would predict that the spin and the mass are constant over every single, uh, every single one of these flares. And you start to see some deviation. It could suggest that there's something interesting happening, or at least around some characteristic radius. And specifically for the NGEHT is what's exciting is that this is, should be totally possible with a monitoring campaign. So for instance, the results I was showing in this talk are, uh, are, shown, are, are based on a baseline coverage or a EHT telescope with these orange things here. If we just take a, a subset of the NGEHT, mon, uh, the proposed NGEHT array, and just take uh, the pieces that we're in control of and LMA and, uh, and LMT and SMA, you get this blue baseline coverage. And so just with like a, a monitoring campaign where you're constantly pointed at Sagittarius A star for a few weeks or a couple months, you could extract a, a large number of these hotspots and construct one of these tomographic maps. The other thing is that tomo this tomography gets a little bit easier at higher wavelengths. Um, as you go from as you go to higher wavelengths, the optical depth from the accretion flow decreases, and also that refractive scattering and the scattering itself just really decreases as well. So you get a much cleaner signal of this hotspot. The other thing is that you can construct these hotspots at a bunch of different frequencies and actually measure something like the achromaticity of strong lensing. And so in summary, the big things I want people to kind of take away from this talk is that this time variability and these lensing and, and time experiments really provide a really excellent way to probe space time and provide a new test of general relativity. And I think this is a, is a nice way to go forward that doesn't rely on having extreme um, angular resolution that might be needed for, to measure like some of these higher order photon rings. The other thing is that these multiple flares allow you to tomographically map space time. And I really think the NGEHT array would provide an absolutely great way to construct these types of catalogs quite quickly. All right, thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, any questions, please raise your hand. Uh, Shahar. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask about the frequency of these flares. What, what do we know about how frequent do these flares uh, happen? So I think Carol will know this definitely better than me, but I, I think like from past literature, at least for the X-ray and the infrared, it's around like one to three times a day. So they, they do happen pretty, pretty often. So if you take like an eight hour observing window a night and do that over like a third of the year, that's about like 20 to 60 flares. 
Yeah, that sounds about right to me. The, the cautionary note, of course, is that the flares are not a regular phenomenon. Yeah. Um, and so you could have many nights where you see nothing and then you could have a night where it goes bang, 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 and it's all very exciting. Um, so it's a bit of a serendipity game. The other thing to know is that it's the case that it, it's much more variable at infrared than at x-ray. So it's not the case that every time you see an infrared flare, you see an x-ray flare. But every time you see an x-ray flare, there's almost always a, a infrared uptick. Thanks. Cool. Uh, any more questions? If not, we can move on to our next talk. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Kataro Moriyama. He's going to be talking about probing black hole space times with NGEHT. So please go ahead, Kataro. Yeah, thank you so much for the instruction. And I would like to share my screen. Yeah, so uh, today I would like to talk about the, um, the, our latest uh, study for, uh, for, for extracting the black hole space time by using the temporal information from uh, EHT and energy HT uh, observations. So uh, our, uh, and also uh, EHT uh, main uh, science goal is the extraction of the black hole space time from uh, spatial and temporal information from over radio to uh, X-ray emission. So this uh, goal provide us the observational proof of the black hole um, space time to test the general relativity theory. And the general, relati general relativity predicts that the black hole space time is uniquely uh, determined by the black hole mass and the spin parameter. And the black hole, black hole mass can be relatively accurately measured by the uh, latest result of M87 uh, shadow size and also uh, the accurate observation for orbiting orbital stars and gas. But black hole spin is not easy to measure because it requires uh, information from vicinity of the black hole and also uh, we need to extract only spin information from the complexity of the uh, gas flow uh, radiation which uh, which really affected by uh, gas properties and the black hole spin uh, values. So uh, for the, in order to um, construct uh, uh, observational, um, observational measurements for black hole spin, uh, we are uh, mainly focused on the gas cloud, which is intermittently falling from the uh, in, um, inner edge of the accretion disk and checks the uh, uh, time development of the infalling gas cloud. This is a quite uh, ideal and simplest case. Uh, we are checking the infrared gas cloud and, uh, and investigate the, investigating the temporal variation uh, from uh, infrared gas cloud. So uh, based on the one uh, gas cloud model, uh, we can see the, uh, we can detect the, uh, uh, we can detect the uh, character, relativistic character character uh, character for uh, temporal uh, fluctuation. Uh, this is an example of the infalling uh, gas cloud, which is uh, um, which is uh, comes from the uh, uh, from the innermost stable orbit, and and radiation uh, has the two kind of main feature. First is the direct component, which directly reaches to sorry uh, to the different observer. And the second component is uh, a radiation, uh, which uh, rotate around the black hole uh, twice, or uh, sorry, once or twice. Due to the, this uh, effect, we can see the uh, we can see the two main peaks for uh, in the uh, total flux density uh, in the in the in, in the each uh, right curves. This is the example of the uh, black, black hole spin is 0.9 and the inclination angle is 75 case. Uh, but we can see the uh, main uh, temporal feature for direct and secondary component. This time interval is uniquely de 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 uh, depend on the uh, depend on the size of the photon sphere orbit. And photo interestingly, photon sphere orbit uh, uniquely depends on the black hole spin. So it as the time uh, interval of this echo uh, provide us accurate me measurement for black hole spin values. 
So this is a uh, uh, spin dependency of this uh, the re relativistic echo comes from the uh, photon rotation ar around the black hole. From uh, if we focus on the uh, left panel, from bottom to right, uh, sorry, from bottom to top, uh, we increase the black hole spin, and also uh, we can see the uh, amplitude of the secondary component indicated by our, uh, each arrow uh, incre monotonically increases due to the uh, frame dragging effect. And also the time interval between direct and the secondary component uh, monotonically uh, decrease because uh, black hole, uh, sorry, a uh, photon's uh, circular orbit uh, uniquely de uh, decrease with black hole spin values. If we focus on the uh, time, uh, time inter interval between direct and the secondary component, there is a, uh, there is a, a consist, um, sorry, uh, there is a uh, consistency between the photon period around the uh, black hole, um, black hole uh, photon sphere orbit. So a uh, red point, a uh, red curve is the time interval between direct and the secondary component and the black is the photon, uh, photon rotation around the black hole for each uh, spin values. These tend uh, this tendency uh, does not significantly depend on the uh, depend on the gas cloud structure, inclination angle, and the velocity field of the black uh, of the infrared gas cloud. The top panels uh, are based on the different uh, thickness of the gas cloud, spectrum index, and actual angle case. But in, importantly, the time interval between direct and secondary component that does not significantly. Uh, depend on such a uh, uh, structure difference of the infrared gas cloud. And in addition to this, uh, the inclination angle shown in the, um, shown in the bottom uh, left panel uh, show uh, that the, uh, the inclination angle does not also affect uh, the, the time interval between direct and secondary component, while the amplitude of the sec secondary component uh, depends on the uh, inclination angle. And also, uh, we can see the uh, the velocity uh, the velocity uh, condition for infrared gas cloud uh, does not uh, significantly depend on the, such a uh, relativistic echo because uh, these component uh, comes from the photon rotation around the black hole. But this case is based on the uh, based on one gas cloud uh, uh, evaluation, and and in real situation we. Uh, we will see the uh, the many uh, plenty number of the infrared gas uh, intermittently falling to the black hole, and uh, as the, the corresponding light curve is more complex by, uh, than this uh, evaluation. So, uh, next uh, topic uh, we check the uh, light curve uh, develop, uh, light curve variability for uh, from from more realistic situation based on. Uh, the evaluation of GRMHD simulation data set. This is a, uh, this is a mat uh, spin equals 0 0.94 and the inclination angle is uh, 40 degrees case. And we can see the um, complex variability for, uh, for from direct and the secondary component as shown in the uh, middle uh, right curve uh, figures. And, and if we uh, focus on the um, radiation region for, the, for this, uh, uh, calculation, the uh, the main uh, main radiation is uh, comes from the outer region from uh, photon circular orbit, which is uh, about uh, about uh, one point nine in this uh, example. But uh, based on this uh, evaluation, uh, sorry, based on calculation, uh, we check the uh, detectability of the. Uh, secondary echo component from such a complex uh, variability, which includes uh, um, which includes a, a, a superposition of the com a complex number of the uh, infrared gas cloud components. So uh, actually, this uh, uh, this right curve includes uh, many kind of uh, uh, structure fr from the superposition of the direct and the secondary component, and also. Uh, Outer, uh, from outer uh, component, which is outside from in, in a, innermost stable orbit. But uh, by using uh, some reduction, uh, proceed, uh, sorry, um, detrending procedure, uh, we can extract the uh, rapid fluctuation comes from, from the vicinity of the black hole. 
This is one example for detecting the, uh, detecting the secondary uh, echo from such a complex uh, light curve information. Uh, so first, uh, we uh, split each, um, each light curve by using the characteristic time scale, which is about uh, 50 to 100, uh, 100 RG over C, and, 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 and performs the residual uh, by using the linear fitting procedure. So uh, this is uh, uh, extraction for uh, extraction for <coughs> uh, for extraction for the uh, for the uh, main component of the second such a secondary uh, uh, short time scale variability from such a um, such a complex light curve information. So light panel is a result of the uh, residual from such from a detrending procedure. And we are now uh, investigating the, uh, investigating the uh, direct and secondary component from such a uh, complex variability. Uh, this is an example of, of the detection for the uh, direct and secondary component. In this example, uh, we perform such a uh, simple, simple superposed short analysis, uh, which has used uh, in the binary uh, X-ray, uh, sorry, X-ray binary black hole, uh, X-ray uh, black hole binary uh, studies. So uh, we are focusing on the uh, focusing on the uh, the maximum peak uh, information for, for the each uh, time epoch and superpose uh, each uh, light curve information by use uh, by aligning the time of the maximum peak uh, component. If we uh, assume that the maximum peak is comes from the direct component, uh, we can see the uh, we will see the uh, secondary echo at the at a certain time uh, after the direct component. So this is a uh, this is a, a result of the a superposition of the light curve. Uh, we can see the uh, first we can first uh, obtain the direct com uh, direct component, and after that we can see the a uh, slow, uh, uh, a broad uh, secondary um, secondary increase uh, comes from the uh, one rotation photon uh, photon uh, inform, uh, photon uh, component. So if we uh, if we uh, uh, split the comp effect of the direct and the secondary component, the secondary uh, uh, secondary radiation, which is about a twenty hours over C, uh, uh, mainly. Uh, Provided by second uh, second uh, feature uh, shown in the uh, red curves. So in this in, in so in this way uh, we can extract the uh, extract the secondary component by using the uh, interpolation method. But uh, essentially uh, it requires detection for the uh, <coughs> uh, detection of the uh, inferring gas cloud a uh, gas cloud component by using the um, a spatial uh, detection for the for in the vicinity of the black hole. So our uh, next topic is uh, we uh, need to uh, accurately uh, extract the vicinity of the black hole by using the uh, sufficiently uh, uh, great uh, ac uh, spatial ac accuracy by using the present or uh, next generation EHT uh, observations. So that's all. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Kataro. Unfortunately, we've run through all of your 12 minutes, so I'll have to move questions directly to the Slack. And we can jump right into our last talk for the session, uh, where we have Shahar Hadar, and he's going to be telling us about photon ring autocorrelations. So please go ahead, Shahar. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about this work in collaboration with Michael Johnson, Alex Kupsaska, and George Wong. Um, so, yeah, so uh, so so we've seen the time averaged image of uh, M87 star, and now uh, we're uh, looking for new targets for MGHT. So one direction which Alex uh, discussed. Uh, this morning is uh, looking at precision measurements of the time averaged image, I average, and uh, 
Another direction is to look for uh, new observables. So why do we think that there should be uh, new observables uh, which are interesting to look at? So uh, this idea comes from uh, just looking at the vast amount of data that HD collected, so much data, and uh, the final image is really generated uh, with a small fraction of it. So a natural question to ask is, can we extract more information from this data? Uh, and specifically on uh, time-dependent processes or looking at more general correlation functions than are looked at by uh, the EHT when constructing the image from the complex visibility. So indeed, what I want to suggest here is that we should look at uh, correlations of the of fluctuations of the intensity along the photon ring at different times and different angles. So the fluctuations of the intensity are defined as the intensity subtracting off the average part. And we want to look at a two-point correlation function of these guys at two different times and two different angles. Uh, and two different angles along the ring. Oops. So that's the idea. Um, and these fluctuations have to be correlated. Why, why do we think they have to be correlated? Because, uh, you know, if, if we look just at any event, any space time event in the vicinity of a black hole, say a flare. Uh, like, like those that uh, we were uh, talking about earlier, then that event connects to the screen of the observer uh, at different points, at different times on the screen. And specifically, most of, the, most of the images of that flare will appear very close to the photon ring because they are uh, basically all, all uh, uh, besides the, the n equals zero image. So they will all appear very close to the photon ring and they will appear at different time at different angles and they have to be correlated somehow. And now the question is just, how are they correlated? So uh, let's, let's kind of try to define uh, what, what's the quantity where we want to look at exactly. So this quantity is the, this two point uh, correlation function on the screen. That's kind of the, the basic uh, object that we can look at at different positions on the screen, but we will suggest to integrate out this radial direction perpendicular to the critical curve and think about the ring just as a, an effective one plus one dimensional object, one uh, angular dimension and one time dimension. Okay, and we will uh, want to look at correlations at different time separations and at different angles along the ring. That object can also be reduced to the light curve by integrating out the light, the angles as well. So if we want to just look at the light curve, we can also integrate out the angles. And okay, so in order to calculate this quantity, we need to uh, go back to uh, uh, the near critical orbits that were discussed nicely by Alex this morning. Um, and what we need to know about these orbits is, is very simple. They're uh, universally characterized by these, this triplet of critical exponents, gamma, delta, and tau that Alex discussed. The gamma tells us how, uh, how fast the gamma basically tells us how unstable this light orbit is. And it tells us how fast we approach this critical radius or how fast we recede from this critical radius. And the delta and tau characterize the, or the, um, the temporal period and azimuthal period of the orbital instead of, of these uh, uh, photon orbits. Okay, so gamma, delta and tau uh, characterize these near critical orbits completely. And uh, now let's look at the simplest case, which is still non-trivial, and, and, uh, and kind of understand how they affect the images of this flare. So if we have some kind of event happening here, let's see a flare, we will see another image. Ah, sorry, I, I didn't say that. I, I want to look now at the situation where I'm uh, a polar observer. So I'm sitting on the pole of a spinning black hole. So looking face on at the black hole. So the black hole is somewhere here behind the, its critical curve and its critical curve is perfectly uh, a circle here because I'm looking at it from the pole. And I'll say that I have some flare here. It will have, that's the n equals zero image. 
it will have a slightly demagnified n equals one image, then an n equals two, n equals three, etc. And in the universal regime of large n or many orbits, which actually practically starts already from n equals one or two, uh, these orbits, these images will be related to each other in a very simple way. They will be rotated relative to each other by an angle delta zero and delayed with respect to each other by a uh, time tau zero. And they will be closer to the critical curve by a factor of e to the minus gamma zero. So this is kind of how this triplet comes into play in the simplest non-trivial case. In the case of a non-polar observer, the story uh, becomes more complicated because now we have many photon orbits that we can see, actually one parameter family of photon orbits that we have access to. And then uh, kind of every point on the critical curve corresponds to a different photon orbits and it all gets mixed up in a more complicated way, but it's still actually tractable analytically. But for this talk, I will just focus on the, uh, on the polar case, um, which is actually quite close to the 70 degrees of M87, you, you can say. Uh, so to analyze this, just to understand what, what the main effect is, uh, we just uh, postulated this, uh, we just uh, calculated this correlation function in the, follow, in the toy model that I will, that I will um, describe now. So we took an equatorial thin disk, okay, which is a delta function disk in the uh, polar direction. And we assume that it's a fluctuating disk with emissivity fluctuations delta j, which have a two point function, which decays with some characteristic uh, correlation length in time LT and radius LR and in azimuth L phi. So it's kind of, this disk is fluctuating. It has some characteristic correlation length in all directions. And we assume this Gaussian shape for this two point function, but we can really take any other shape. It's just the simplest thing uh, that we could do. So that's our, that's our model for uh, a random, randomly fluctuating disk. Now, just to see what kind of our characteristic values for these parameters, this correlation length in radius, azimuth and time, we actually checked, uh, we computed numerically from a GRMHD simulation what these correlation lengths are. And these are the results that we got. Okay, these results here, which are actually, they're nice in the sense that they are uh, shorter than the periods, uh, than, than the, for example, the temporal period of a light ray around such a black hole is about 15 or 16 m. So the temporal correlation length is 3 m. That's much smaller than that. And that was, uh, that will, will be nice uh, as, as you will see in a few slides. And so uh, using this very, very simple model, we can calculate analytically this two point correlation function just by using the radiative transfer equation, plugging in our assumption on the, on the fluctuations of the disk and what we get is a sum over peaks in the autocorrelation plane t and phi. So this is the t direction, the time separation between points. This is big phi, the angular, angular separation between points along the ring. And on this plane spanned by t and phi, we get a collection of peaks which are distributed in a universal way. They're separated in the big phi direction by delta zero, which is exactly the critical exponent relating to uh, how much the images uh, move along the uh, azimuthal direction. They're separated by tau zero in the big T direction, and they're suppressed in amplitude by a relative factor of e to the minus gamma zero. So kind of the way the peaks are distributed in the autocorrelation plane is universally determined by the critical exponents, which are determined by the strong field curve geometry. So this is a completely a GR prediction um, and um, on the other side, we have the shape of the peaks, which here we took to be very simple. Um, but you know, you, you can have a lot more information also by looking at the shape of the peaks in the autocorrelation plane, and that tells you about statistical properties of the accretion flow. So the nice thing about this result is that it separates in a nice way the astrophysical data from the GR data. Um, right. We generalize this also to any inclination. It's, it's a bit more involved, but it actually can be done analytically and also expanded 
and uh, to first order inclination to see that the structure that we found for the polar observer actually holds also uh, to leading order in inclination. So it's actually a, a robust result and it should be true also for say 17 degrees. Um, a little bit uh, very briefly about the observational prospect. So um, this is, you could say a way to see the photon ring uh, because if you see more than one peak in the autocorrelation plane, which is widely separated and clearly separated, then you really saw the photon ring because you saw photons that went around the black hole and came at a different angle and at a later time. So this is, uh, it's not seeing it in the image and resolving it, but it's seeing a signal of it. Um, and this will allow to test strong field GR and to measure both the mass and the spin. This is a very, uh, this could be a very efficient way to measure the spin because uh, these critical exponents are sensitive to the spin. And the nice thing is that you do not need to resolve the width, the width of the ring. So I don't, even if NGHD does not go up into space, uh, this has a chance of working and um, we think and um, and we also, um, the nice thing about it is that to get better precision, you need to average over more time. You, more telescopes will also help because you need more and more statistical realizations. It's a statistical uh, observable. So if you have more and more statistical realizations, um, uh, you have better chance to measure this. Sorry to interrupt, Shahar. Oh, we are finishing up. Okay, good. Yes, exactly. Um, Great, so I described to you this new observable that we're proposing for the NGHT, uh, the two point function of intensity fluctuations on the photon ring. Uh, and this thing is maybe it's not making a movie, uh, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a time, uh, it's a time dependent thing. And it's really kind of extracting, if we, even if we had a movie, we could extract this observable from it. Of course, the, the, the other direction is, is not, uh, doesn't have to doesn't have to happen. This is kind of extracting the universal data from from a movie. Even if we had a movie, this is kind of extracting only the universal part. Um, and there are many different generalizations and extensions, but uh, uh, most excitingly, I think this is something that we can possibly actually measure uh, in the coming years. Thank you. Thanks very much, Shahar. Um, so since we are kind of over time already, I will direct more questions to Slack again. And I'll just say thank you very much to all of our speakers for their awesome talks.